to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of masculine spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. And soup up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now, here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. Today, I'm coming to you from Cocoa Beach. We just got back from a, a pretty long excursion, more like an expedition. They called it a pilgrimage. We went in the footsteps of St. Paul uh, all through the areas of Greece where he, uh, where he uh, traveled by foot mostly, and he seemed to not have good luck with ships because he had so many shipwrecks in his, in his uh, resume, but we had a great trip uh just trying to kind of uh, absorb it all i've been studying the life of saint paul for about a year now along with all the other things that i like to read and man he's a challenge to all of us to kind of man up and get gritty and uh, life is so short and to, and to not waste it uh uh you know enjoy life of course but uh share the good news and, and be ready be ready, be ready as peter said with the reason for your hope the one the one thing about catholicism that i love so much is i mean we're there we're there in Athens, man. We're there where Socrates and Plato and Aristotle were. And Catholics uh, don't deny the use of your brain you know, to reason. The Bible says, come, let us reason together. And though your sins be like scarlet, they'll be white as, as, as wool. Though they be like crimson, they'll be white like the snow. Reason is a big part of Catholicism. <clears throat> uh, and, it's, and it's the integration, not the intersection, but the actual integration of faith and reason faith seeking understanding you know augustine loved uh plato and uh at least he was exposed to neoplatonism and he you see him use it a little bit here and there even paul a little bit and then of course thomas aquinas loved the philosopher aristotle and most of our catholic priests our catholic priests have to go through several courses of philosophy before they even study theology why so that we can reason and think and understand um that's why i think I have such a great hope for this youngest generation now that they've been kind of uh, sold a bill of goods, uh, that there isn't a God, or if there is a God, it's kind of like anything goes, and, uh, and you get to go to heaven just be the same way you get a participation trophy by, by playing, just by showing up on a soccer field. Uh, but they're, they're figuring it out, that the emperor, empire, emperor is not wearing any clothes, that all these uh, teachings, the Richard Dawkins of the world, and all of this is just a bill of goods. They know they have an upward yearning for God, and when they come to try to, to come to grips with it, they're not going to want to hear someone say, well, the Bible says this and the Bible says that, because first you need to build a bridge uh, to, to bring them to the Bible because they have this sense that it's some superstitious book of myths. And so that's why I think the Catholic Church is the greatest hope for the millennial generation coming to Christ because we can approach them first with reason and then bring them to revelation and then, and then the integration of the two. So uh, that's why I'm stoked to have... Uh, Carlo Broussard on our radio show today. He's uh, part of the Catholic Answers uh, team, I would say, uh, speaking all over. He's, a, he's, a, he's an apologist. But uh, Carlo Broussard, before we go any further than that, I think I should, we should do a warning that uh, Carlo is also a Cajun. <laughs> so, welcome to the yeah. show. Hey, Bear. Thanks for having me, brother. Yeah, I might talk funny every once in a while. You know, I got well, you some time from southern Louisiana. Oh, man. Uh, southern draw sometimes. People They're, make fun of me. I and heard they, it. I just heard it a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> man, I can talk really thick if, you, thick if you want. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's like <laughs> me with uh, every now and then I, I slip into a little pigeon. Oh, and yeah? It just, and it just kind of happens, right? You don't know yes, it. Yes, sir. Just kinda, all of a sudden, sure. I realize, oh, I'm speaking with that lilt, and I got that little pigeon happening. You know? That's right. Yeah. That's right. I love the Cajun sound, though. really do. Yeah, it's a it's a great culture in southern Louisiana. To be Cajun is to be Catholic. One thing about our Cajun culture is Catholicism is sort of embedded in it. Mm. Uh, so it's sort of a cultural thing, just like among the Hispanics, it's a cultural thing, you know. Mm. Uh, but a lot of good Cajun folk or good Catholics, man, they 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 live their faith faithfully down in southern Louisiana. A lot of big families from where I'm from. You know, yeah. when I go around and I tell people I have five kids, you know, they're like, what? Five kids? <laughs> you got your hands full. And I'm like, brother, 
You that's don't nothing. know. <laughs> that's not relative to the people I run with. <laughs> no, I remember. You know, you think about too, right down there in the middle of the Bible Belt. There's this, there's this little uh, bastion of Catholicism. I've gotten to speak to the Legatus uh, groups there in, in awesome. Indiana. Hey, when we yeah. rolled thunder through uh, on lo- season one of Long Ride Home, we're rolling thunder from Florida over to California. We had okay. to go through this place called Louisiana. Yeah, yeah. And we were met at the border of uh, Alabama and Louisiana by a bunch of Cajun Catholic Cross Bear Motorcycle Club. They met us at the border. We Sweet. thought, oh, they're so happy to see us. And they're going to just, you know, greet us. And they said, oh, no, we're going to ride with you all the way to Texas. And I realized as time went on that I think they just wanted to make sure we left the state. <laughs> 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 but, but what is it yeah. to be a Cajun? What I mean, like, yeah, I mean, what is it? That's a great question. And uh, to be honest with you, I, I don't know if I've ever articulated a definition. Number one, you have to have a name like Broussard. <laughs> and how do you really? How how would they say it? Yeah, well, I mean, we we're 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 descendants of the original group of Acadians who were exiled out of Acadie in uh, in Canada in the eastern part of Canada. I can't remember the exact year when they were exiled out, but I'm original descendant of one of the original Broussard. I'm a descendant of one of the original Broussard brothers that wow. was exiled and made their way to Louisiana. Uh, but, I mean, sort of in the popular sense, you know, you love crawfish, you love crawfish, <laughs> Etouffee, you love gumbo, and you love Jambalaya. Cajun cheese. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, it's just it's one of those things, you know, we have a distinct food, distinct food, distinct culture. We have distinct music. In fact, as part of my backstory is uh, from Southern Louisiana. I played professionally Cajun music. Uh, I played the Cajun oh. accord and oh had my, my own, I had my own band from the time I was 13 oh to the my. time I was 20. I mean, I'm, yes. I'm not a big my fan backstory. of the accordion. But the, people, yeah, now, but, now, but, the, but the people who know to, how to pl- use an accordion properly, they don't play it. They manipulate it, and that's a, that's it, a Cajun. Yeah, that's know? right. And the Cajun accordion is different than other kinds of accordions. It's <laughs> you know, not a big old piano thing. It's not yeah. like a polka polka thing, you know. Yeah. And the type of music that we played as Cajuns, um, it's, it's not like polka music. Right? You can't you help can... but get up and start hopping around. That's I mean, right. You, right. Re- you really – I mean, like uh, polka and all that. I'm sorry, everybody, but – you know, yeah, I just I don't Lawrence think it, Welk and all that, but I don't oh my God, it. Cajun music! It just you can't help yeah. it. I, I play it sometimes just to kind of get myself going. Awesome. You know, awesome. yeah. yeah, you can check it out on my website, crollabrusor.com. Just type in "blast from the past." I have about five clips there you can listen to audio files from when I was nineteen, a gig that we were playing in Southern Louisiana. And what we did, Bear, is we kind of had a mixture of the traditional Cajun music with rock and roll and stuff. Dude, and so that's we, the thing that that's so yeah. cool. You know, it's, yeah, like in, yeah. it's like in Hawaii, you know, uh, Kelly, Kelly Boy DeLima, a, a good friend of mine, probably the best known ukulele player in the islands. He's playing Hawaiian style, and then all of a sudden he's mixing it up with rock and roll. And like, where did that come from, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Awesome. Yeah, so we played a, a range of like ZZ Top to like no Wilson kidding. Pitt. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah, we played some funk stuff here and there, you know, and I'd put the accordion in it and whatnot. How about some and- rap? Any rap? No, no rap, man. I didn't do any rap. In fact, though, although there are some Cajun bands uh, who actually do some sort of rap stuff with their music, but that was never my cup of tea. So that's uh, so cool, man. We could talk about this for a while, but we gotta we gotta keep moving. Uh, so, like like Cajun music would make you want to do. Can you give us a little introduction? We got a couple of minutes here before our break. Uh, raised a Cajun, raised a cat, which means Catholic. What was your your uh, walk towards a deeper conversion with the Lord? Yeah, well, I had a religious sense planted in me from my mom's witness when I was about 10, 11. I had some profound religious experiences as a young boy. My mother was a devout Catholic taking me to retreats, leading the youth group, choir, and all of that. So I was able to be exposed to some youth retreats, you know, thousands of youth, and had some profound religious experiences. So that religious sense was planted in me. When you say religious experience, you mean like an encounter? Yeah, sort of, you know, the experience of the Holy Spirit, you know, type of thing, you know, and experiencing our Lord's presence in the Eucharist and having that deep, profound uh, feeling of God's love and that consolation and being drawn to that. People people can actually have an encounter with the Lord. Yeah, amen. And and I've had a couple of those experiences as a young boy. Now, of course, that religious sense sort of became eclipsed 
as I started playing music because I was in the bars from the time I was 13 and getting into the nightclubs at 17 playing music and whatnot. And about 17 is when sort of that religious sense became eclipsed. Uh, however, my saving grace was actually a Protestant friend of mine who had befriended me, and he started teaching me about a, having a relationship with Jesus, and that attracted me, sort of got me thinking about my relationship with Jesus, and then a, a somewhat of a Protestant influence there from my Protestant friend, but ultimately the turning point was listening to a conversion story of my boss now, Tim Staples. <laughs> yeah, oh, <laughs> that'll I, wake uh, you up. Uh, we're, ta we're talking with Carlo Broussard. I want to say Bruce. I want to say it more like how you really say the name back in the day, what how would you say? We just say Broussard. Broussard, yeah. Our Cajun uh, friend from Catholic Answers and uh, his, his writer of, he's got two books. One, one, the original one was, uh, oh, Prepare the Way. But your new one is called Meeting the Protestant Challenge. That's right. That uh, comes out this fall. It'll come out about the time. This show will be airing uh, just a month or two before it comes out. So check it out. And your website, spell your name. So that people can find you on your website. Yeah, yeah. So my first name's Carlo, K A R L O. Last name Broussard, B R O U S S A R D dot com. Carlo Broussard dot com. And so you came up with a real creative website, Carlo Broussard dot com. <laughs> this is the Bear Wozniak adventure. This is Bear Wozniak with Carlo. Sometimes you meet someone on the radio you just wish you could just hang out with, you know. And Carlo is definitely one of those. Uh, so we're gonna hang out with him again. We'll be back right after this break. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. And, you know, uh, being a Christian is an adventure. And, uh, you know, Cindy and I have this kind of plan up our sleeves that on December 9th, uh, Deep Adventure is going on a cruise, and we want to invite you guys to go with us. Uh, on the 8th, we're having our, our annual luau in Cocoa Beach, Florida. And the next day, we're taking a four-night, five-day cruise to the Bahamas, and I'm going to be teaching from my book, my second book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue on the Seven Virtues. And uh, we're going to be doing that on the very cruise ship that I escaped to. I don't know. Uh, our guest, Carla Broussard, knows when you try to write, it's almost impossible uh, with all the distractions, especially if you're already in ministry. So I got on this cruise ship three times in a row, real cheap cruise, inner berth, by the way. And uh, I just escaped to the cigar deck and wrote uh, the first, uh, you know, pass it pass of, of, of this book uh, by taking cruise ships like Jack London and, and Robert Louis Stevenson used to do. I get, I get it now. They would get on these ships so they could get away from everybody and write. So we're going on that very same ship, the Carnival Liberty. So it'll kind of be kind of cool. So go to deepadventure.com and uh, join us on our cruise, get to know each other and uh, have a good time in the morning of the luau. Uh, Cindy and I are going to teach surfing. We're going to uh, do a tandem surfing exhibition. In the afternoon, some people are going to go to... Uh, the Kennedy Space Center, the bikers that show up are going to go on a renegade rosary run, uh, and uh, and others can just stay and play at the beach, and then we have the luau in the next morning mass, and then jump on the ship and go on our adventures. So join us. Go to deepadventure.com and join our cruise. We got we have with us today uh, our Cajun. We, everyone, you got to have at least one Cajun, I guess, on the show. <laughs> Carlo, Carlo Broussard, who is an, a Catholic apologist, uh, but really... Uh, Really, he's uh, he is a radical Cajun accordion player. He he, do you ever pick that up anymore and, and, and do a gig? Uh, I was actually gigging a little bit about a year ago. I found some guys down here in San Diego who love yeah. Cajun music, and they oh. actually have a little Cajun band. We actually played the House of Blues, man. No, you're kidding me. Yeah, here in San Diego. Here in San Diego, we had wow. a great time, you know. So it was good. I can't play like I used to. Like I can't really throw down like I used to, you know. I mean, your fingers so kind of move fast, right? Yeah, yeah. Music. It's it, my arm and my fingers and my hand muscles. They're just shot, man. And so it, it is difficult. I can play about 75%. So I, I, good enough for people to have fun and enjoy it. Not good enough like in the day. But you need an ukulele player? <laughs> I, I, I've never tried that with Cajun I'll music. Bring, I'll sure bring we it, can, man. We can make it work, I'll brother. bring it, yeah. But I'm like <laughs> you too. Like It's funny how the songs kind of come back to you automatically, and then all of a sudden like they just stop. Like Where did the rest of the song go? I don't remember. That's right. What's oh, the yeah, next the chord? Yeah, Amen your fingers that, know it more than your mind knows it. Almost. That's, that's right. Really cool. That's right. Well, uh, Carlo, I want to ask you a question. You know, I love, I love Father Robert Spitzer. By the way, how is he doing? I know he recently had a fall. 
Uh, yeah, I had heard about that. I don't get to chat with him often now, uh, now that I'm not working with him anymore, yeah. because when you work with him, you know that he works. Yeah. <laughs> and it's nonstop. He must. He must. That's right. That's right. Uh, but I think he's recovering okay. He did fall and perhaps broke his collarbone, I think I'd heard, or something like that. But I think he is doing better, and he's on the road to recovery. Well, but uh, he, to... something like that doesn't stop that man. Well, you got to see. Now, look, check this out. So here's my... For those of you watching on YouTube, those are the seven virtue cigar samplers with my man cave cigars. Uh, every one, of, you know, shows the image of the Renaissance painting of one of the women that represents each of the seven virtues. And then we have those cigars uh, with the label on it. You have to take off so you can enjoy the full cigar. And on the inside is a quote from my book on on one of those virtues. And believe it or not, this is the biggest seller on our website by far. Is our, our man cave seven virtue cigars? But I got to have a, awesome. a man cave cigar with Father Robert at the last Napa Institute and sat right <laughs> next to him. Didn't know what to say. You know, I was afraid he would start yeah. quizzing me again on his book. But, right, yeah, we right. love Father Robert Spitzer, our, our, our show uh, in Hawaii that we filmed, um, The Long Ride Home, which won't air for a couple more years. We did it based on his, uh, his series of books, uh, and we did it on The Upward Yearning. But I know you have uh, done some work on uh, the four – uh, the, I, I don't forget the title, but the four roots of happiness for, uh, uh, as far as four happiness. levels. Yeah. And you know what? My next book is called, you're going to dig it. It's kind of like your book 50. What is it called? Um, I can't read. <laughs> well, your new book is called, uh, what? yeah. Beating the Protestant challenge. And the subtitle how is answer, how to answer 50 biblical objections to Catholic beliefs. Okay. So my next book that I'm working on now is called, uh, 24 rules for manliness. The antidote oh, to the sweet. anti, the antidote to the anti, um, toxic masculinity scam. Oh, so sweet. yeah. So I mean, we have what we got. Our, we do what we, you and I both like lists. But tell me what this, uh, what this um, about this one area that you talk about the four uh, levels of manhood. You got six yeah. minutes. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is basically just a talk that I developed from based on the work that I was doing with Father Spitzer on the four levels of happiness. I mean. He, he's done a masterful job of synthesizing, you know, thousands of years worth of philosophy concerning human happiness, dating all the way back to Aristotle. And so what I did when I was working with him, I would travel and speak and promote his material. And I developed a talk on the four levels of happiness ordered specifically toward men. So just titling it the four levels of manhood. So basically the first level is the man of pleasure and possession. So that is the man who defines his manhood in terms of seeking physical pleasure and acquiring material goods, right? Second level is the man of ego comparative advantage, what Father Robert Spitzer likes to say, the guy who – the man who defines his manhood in seeking – and you're gaining the comparative advantage over the other. Ego is just the Latin word for I, right? So it's focused on himself, trying to achieve more than the other, more popularity, more success, more power, more control, more esteem, you name it. The third level is the man of contribution and service. So that's the man who seeks to contribute to the good outside of himself. So rather than being ego in or focused on self, he then turns out and is focused on the other, seeking to influence his, his community, his sphere of influence, whether it's the family, society, the culture, or even the world or the church, right? Now, the, man, the fourth level of manhood is the man of the eternal perspective. So this is the man who defines his life in terms of achieving union with God and coming to possess that which is pure goodness, pure truth itself, God himself. And of course, the fourth level of manhood is going to involve the other levels of manhood. It does not exclude pleasure and possession, does not exclude comparative advantage. It does not exclude, obviously, contribution and service to the good outside of itself, but it rightfully orders those lower levels of manhood to the highest level of manhood of being a man of the eternal perspective. So it approaches pleasure, possession, comparative advantage, seeking the good and influence of others with the eternal perspective in ordering it appropriately to our final goal, which is union with God. And so 
that's the beauty of the man of the eternal perspective. It's not just this holy roly guy who's totally separated from doing the things in the world, right? As Jesus said, we're in the world, but not of the world. We simply have to properly order those good things and approach them. So that's sort of a summary of these four levels of manhood. You know, it's like uh, the monks of the desert, memoriam Arta, remember your death. You have to live like you're going to die. That's right. And that's you know, with gotta, the eternal perspective, brother. <laughs> yeah, and, and you got to live like everyone you love is going to die, too. That's right. And you see, the thing about these lower goods, right, the pleasure, possession, success, achievement, and even relationship with others, these are goods that are passing there. They're temporary. They come and they go. Obviously, pleasure and material goods are not going to last as long as human relationships, but even human relationships and the, and the, those goods, they are passing because what, what happens, we all know for sure, we're going to die and death will take away these lower goods. So we need to ensure that we're united in possessing the ultimate good, who is God himself, which once we possess at the moment of death, if we die in friendship with Christ, that's a good that will never be taken away from us. And, and that's can- why it's called everlasting happiness in heaven. And if you think about the people that you love, you can bring them with you. It's the only thing, you can, the only thing you can really bring to heaven with you is other people. And you can, That's right. And, and so to, to uh, oh, my God, live your life as an example for the people in your life that's we see in Hawaii, Kuleana, that you have Kuleana for, uh, a sense of stewardship for. Uh, yeah. Lead by example. Um, don't just talk, but, but you know, walk the walk and, 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 and win, win people to... Uh, to that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and that's a, that, I'm glad you said that because that's a perfect example of taking that level two manhood, right? Gaining the comparative advantage, seeking that good and success and winning, right? Mm-hmm. But ordering it appropriately to the kingdom. And I see so many men now that are doing that. In the new evangelization, I see so many men that have been so successful in different areas of life, in their yeah. career pursuits or whatever, that's and all right. of a sudden it's like, Let's take this to the next level, dude. And all of a sudden, they're using those gifts and talents and skill sets, best practices, pursuit of excellence, and now that's being used to communicate the good news. It's just Amen. Like, it just plug that in, and all of a sudden, the lights come on. You know, the, all that. That's right. Those basic uh, uh, attributes and 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 the basic way that human being was made by God when he was infused with his soul, and then the way he's uh, developed those skills. And now all of a sudden you plug it into the new evangelization. And wow, we're talking with a Carlo Broussard, uh, a, a Catholic apologist. Uh, used to be uh, with uh, Robert Spitzer and uh, Father Robert Spitzer, and also is a speaker and often on the radio with Catholic Answers, which you got to be good, man. You know what I want to do, Carlo? I want to buy every book Catholic Answers has. It'll be the next That's thing it. I do, and I'll read there you all go. of those. It may take me a few years. But do, we, can you stop writing for a while until I get caught up? <laughs> no, because the boss <laughs> says, keep writing. <laughs> We're talking with Carla Broussard, the, the Cajun uh, uh, apologist. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Aloha, and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Uh, you know, life is supposed to be fun. Uh, we have, a, we have a, a, a way of taking ourselves too seriously sometimes, and we kind of get in the way of really just the pure joy of uh, what it's like to live a life uh, fully infused with, uh, with the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit. You know, humans are meant to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Uh, you, you have a spiritual soul. Uh, and, you know, life gets kind of uncomfortable and doesn't seem to quite fit, and you take yourself a little bit too seriously, and uh, you miss out on just the simplicity of what it means to give your life to Jesus and experience the infusion of his love and his truth. And so letting, letting you know that uh, we need, we'd love to invite you to come and have a little bit of fun with us. We have our deep adventure, Luau and Cruise. That's going to be happening on December 8th for the Luau, December 9th, for the four-night cruise in the Bahamas. Come to Cocoa Beach and join Cindy and I for some fun. And what we say in Hawaii, recreation can lead to recreation. If you kind of pull yourself out of your normal environment um, and you get some perspective on your life and get a sense of a new direction God may be leading you. We have Carlo Broussard with us, uh, mainly famous for his accordion playing as a Cajun musician. What's the name of your new band, by the way? 
uh, no name. What the band out the band, the guy the that was one. playing the, in San Diego? Yeah, the one yeah. that was. Yeah, is that the? Uh, House I, of Blues? To be honest with you, I don't remember what they <laughs> called themselves. We didn't really have a band it's name. It's tough. It's tough, man, to come up with a band name. You know. Yeah, yeah. I don't play with them anymore, but I, I did. They kicked play you out. Huh? They kicked you yeah, out. Yeah. No, I don't know. We just. Uh, I don't know if they're playing anymore or whatever. We just had a few gigs. They said, "Hey, why don't you come and join us?" It's so cool, man. So you've been. He's been playing. He's had a band since he was thirteen, but he. But Carlo Broussard, carlobroussard.com, K A R L O B R O U S S A R D. Double two S's. Yeah. Catholic apologist. Okay, so we talked a little bit about and just touched on the on the surface of that about the four levels of happiness. Uh, I guess that's what it is the four levels of happiness for manhood. Well, we were talking about the four levels of manhood. It's basically the manhood. four levels of happiness apply to men specifically. And, you know, yeah. uh, uh, Aristotle believed that a man of virtue, the true happiness is be living a life of virtue. That's but right. he had just those four virtues of justice, self-mastery, prudence, fortitude, the four cardinal virtues. Right, As right. Catholics, right. we know Paul looked at his life and said, actually, I need a little bit more. So he added the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. Uh, but there's nothing, nothing uh, he, you know, it's interesting to see. I, I have a friend who's an atheist. And he's profoundly virtuous in the four cardinal. Amen. Things. Yeah. More virtuous yeah, there, than most there, Christians I know. Yeah, uh, that's it. There's a lot of atheists out there who would put who will who would put Christians to shame concerning exercising natural virtue. So it's sort of the you know, the classical idea of the virtuous pagan. You know, the idea who is doesn't believe in God, but they're still able to exercise virtue pursue those goods that are truly good for us insofar as we're human beings and this is the classical understanding of the natural moral law given the natural light of reason there's an order of goodness that we are able to discover inscribed within our nature as human beings and then of course a human being is capable to exercise his free will to order his life direct his human activity behave and conduct his life in such a way that's in accord with that good and what's good for us as human beings now granted the the ultimate good is god himself but for some people they fall short in seeing that good and having that goodness and that desire for the good inscribed within us, within our nature. So they fall short in pursuing that good. But there, the other goods that we're able to come to know uh, about us as human beings, they can pursue. You know, and the, the thing about it is the, the, there's so many people now that uh, their reason for being atheists is because of, uh, like this friend of mine, he was raised by fundamentalist Christians on a Christian commune in the Big Island, and he was told the... the he, he learned all of his math from the Bible and that everything in the Bible was absolutely true. You know, the world is 6,000 years old and things like that. And he knew it not he knew it to be false. Plus, it, w it was an oppressive environment, you know, where right. especially as you can see, you're not allowed to think. And so he's kind of an atheist for all the right reasons in that sense. Uh, but understand. that life of virtue, it kind of breaks up the follow ground so that it may prepare him for the seed of the gospel when it's pre presented to him in a credible way, by a credible sure. person. Amen. That yeah. pursuit of truth and that pursuit of goodness on the natural level can properly dispose the soul so that when somebody does come and present the truth, as you said, bear in a credible and persuasive way, it's going to be some there's going to be some fertile ground there for him to receive that truth and for that seed of the word of God to be planted and rooted deeply in his soul. But I also see like the millennial generation, uh, man, they have they are full on under a attack uh, especially in the area i think of pornography I amen think porno pornography is this thing that invades the soul and the soul the soul feels shame because of that and so isolates itself like adam did in the garden from god mm, that's and so right. so you're kind of given over to a mindset that well i'll change you i who that my my soul kind of knew that there was a god and a personal god and i have this conscience but i got a more and more uh, recreate in my mind who God is and make him more and more distant itself. Finally, he just disappears. Disappears, yeah. yeah. So what do you say to that person right now that's kind of found themselves trapped in that kind of mindset that there really is no God? And a lot of it's because they can't handle the personalness of God. Mm, he, yeah. He has some, he loves them and has, and also requires something from them. Yeah, well, I mean, fundamentally, I would simply try to probe a bit and asking them, well, you know, why 
aren't you thinking that? Why don't you think that God exists? I mean, is it really an intellectual problem? Like you need some persuasive philosophical evidence? Because I can provide that for you. You know, we have a series of philosophical arguments given to us by St. Thomas Aquinas, even some contemporary arguments that can show you by the natural light of human reason that God exists. But if, if but if the problem is sort of an emotional problem and you're just not feeling God's presence, I guess what I would say to that is that First of all, we need to start with what we know to be true. If God exists, then we need to start rightfully ordering our lives to him and knowing that he's all good and that he is all loving. He is going to provide you and provide all of us with those graces. We call it a grace, right? It's just a power from on high that we need to begin rightfully directing our lives to him and living in a way that he wants us to live, to follow his plan of happiness and to trust. It's, I mean, there is a leap of faith there. You're going to have to trust that he is going to bless you with the satisfaction and the, 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 the satisfaction and the happiness that you long to have by living in accord with his plan. It might be a little, there might require some suffering initially, right? Because in order to detach from those sensual pleasures, right, that are, that are disordered, right? We're engaging in sensual pleasures sometimes outside of God's plan for human happiness. There will, it will require some effort and some suffering to try to detach ourselves and to turn our will away from those disordered pleasures and seek God. But given that God is all good and all loving, he's revealed himself through the loving son, Jesus Christ, who died for us on the cross, he will give you those blessings that you long for and to give you the satisfaction and the peace of conscience that you long for in living your life for him. So it's a matter of come and see, right? If mm. it's just an emotional problem, it's just simply repeating the words of Jesus and say, come and see and extend the invitation. And you won't know until you try it. It's so, it's so perfect. You know, I think about this. It's exactly right. You know, how do you, you know, the little kid that says, I don't want to eat that. Uh, my, my wife, Cindy, uh, uh, raised her niece for a while. We call her Hanai in, in Hawaii. Uh, and she would take her, and, and the little niece hadn't been exposed to a lot of different foods, and she'd take her out to eat, and she goes, well, I don't want to eat that. And she well, I think she kind of bribed her, right? <laughs> she goes, well, I really like that. And the thing is, is like, I remember thinking, I don't want God's kind of happiness. I don't want that kind of happiness. I want my kind of happiness. You know, I'm a drummer. Right. I, I want to surf. I want to do this. I want to do that. And I don't want God's kind of happiness. He's going to make me into something that I'm not. I'm not going to fit into that box. Neither you or I are going to fit into boxes very easily. Maybe some right. people more easily than others. But I'm not going to fit in that box. I'm not going to feel closed in. <coughs> Excuse me. I need to plug in my cough box. <laughs> <coughs> But, you know, it's like I, I don't want to become a Christian because then I'm going to like going to church, and I don't want to like going to church. It's kind of like that feeling. But undeniably, uh, God know, created you. He, you're, you. You are uniquely infused with a, with a spiritual soul that God infused into you, the moment of your conception. And he knows what's going to make you happy. The more, the more you abandon yourself to God's will, the more like yourself you become and the more, and the more joy you feel. That's right. If he created you and he knows every single aspect of your entire existence in your being, well, then for sure he's going to know what makes you happy, right? And he and doesn't so want he, us to be happy, right? He wants us to be like, <laughs> right? Uh, not quite there, right? He, he definitely wants us to be happy. And our happiness lies in him alone because he's the ultimate good. He's the only thing that can completely satisfy the desires of the human heart. So as Augustine said famously in his confessions, our hearts are restless until they rest in you, O God. Amen. We're talking with Carlo Broussard. Can you spell it so that they get to the right website? Yeah, Carlo, K-A-R-L-O. So that's Carlo with a K and then last name Broussard, B-R-O-U-S-S-A-R-D. Dot com. And you're dot and com. You're, and there you're, you go. You're, you're, you have one book out. Another one's coming out soon. Can you give us both those titles? Yeah, so uh, my, my first book, which is about a year old now, it was a year in April of 2019, uh, so that's Prepare the Way, Overcoming Obstacles to God, the Gospel, and the Church. So I coach you in strategies on how to remove obstacles for atheists, agnostics, and skeptics, obstacles to truth, God, Jesus, Christianity as a religion, and the church. My next book, uh, my second book coming on fall 2019 is Meeting the Protestant Challenge, 
how to answer 50 biblical objections to Catholic beliefs. So the idea is that the old challenge was where is that in the Bible? But a Catholic is not – it's not necessary a Catholic meet that challenge because it operates on sola scriptura and demanding that we have evidence from the Bible for a belief. This challenge is how can the Catholic Church teach X when the Bible says Y? Perfect. So, Perfect. Hey, we got to go. We got to go. We got to take a break, but we'll be right back with Carlo Broussard. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wasik Adventure. Hey, you men out there, we want to have you uh, join the man cave. Go to deepadventure.com. You can become a member of a secret Facebook group, uh, the, the Bear's Man Cave. You can't join it by going to Facebook and requesting to be a member. You have to go to the website. There's actually a fee to be a member, a monthly fee. But when you get there, you're with a bunch of guys that really love the Lord, that will challenge you that will equip you, that will mobilize you. We uh, have Zoom video chat meetups about every two or three weeks. The last one we had, it was pretty cool. One of the members, the newer members, is a member of a parish that just seems to be just kind of fading away. And he said, I'm, I was thinking about leaving. I was just about ready to leave. And then I thought, no, I'm going to stay. And he, uh, he volunteered to be a member of the church council. I don't think he would have done that without the man cave being there to kind of challenge him and equip him. Others are starting their own uh, man cave groups. Uh, one of the things a lot of them do is they have a, a little night uh, on the back deck of their, their porch, uh, invite buddies over that would never, maybe never even been to a church, and they have a shot of whiskey and one of our man cave cigars, and they talk about the virtues. Uh, so it's kind of like uh, we love our, we love our, fam- our, our That Man Is You. I helped start get that program in Hawaii started. But a lot of guys would never even go until they first have, you know, they call it... Um, uh, you, you evangelize through friendship and through relationship. And you got to really care about people. You can't just be evangelizing them. you got to uh, really think of them as a friend and be a friend to them. And then you have the right to share the gospel w- with them. We're talking with Carlo Broussard, uh, who is a Catholic apologist, a Cajun, uh, most famous in my ma- mind for being uh, a Cajun accordion player, which is about the most radical thing you can be. Uh, playing ZZ Top and a little traditional Cajun back when he was 13 years old. Uh, but we, Carlo, I want to ask you, we got just this last little segment. Yeah. Two or three of the, the misconceptions that Protestants have, not so much you believe this and why, but you believe this and, well, no, we don't. What are those? Right. Give us two or three of those. Yeah, well, I mean, the most common that everybody runs into and it's it's amazing you think it would be a dead horse but it's still alive and kicking right the idea that we worship mary or we worship the saints and so the simple response is no we don't right (laughs) who told you that and that's something that we commonly run into right another common misconception is what what, what do we do what do we do that's right well very good question so we honor that's right we don't we don't give the honor that is due to God alone to Mary and the saints. We honor them and give them the due honor as perfected members of the mystical body of Christ. And of course, Mary being the pinnacle within the created order, she deserves a special honor, but it's still not the honor that is due to God alone as the infinite creator of all. So we honor Mary and the saints. We request their help. We request their prayers. Sure, we have the intercession of the saints, but we do not worship them. And even the visible gestures that we do, like having the statues, bowing in front of the statues, giving flowers to the statues, is in no way uh, necessarily an act, an act of worship. It's simply an act of honor that's ordered to the person that the statue represents. Right? Well, you see that at the, uh, we're going to be going to D.C. and filming part of Long Ride Home in August. You see that at the war memorials, you know, it's yes. a great honor. And we have the words dulia, hyperdulia, and latria. Can you right. just... Because it sounds so official when you use those. Can you like yeah. explain what that is? Yeah, Latri- Latria is simply uh, Latin for worship that is due to God. Hyperdulia is that special honor that's reserved to the Blessed Mother as the pinnacle of God's creation. And then Dulia is simply the honor that is due to uh, members, perfected members of the mystical body of Christ who are righteously uh, dwelling in heaven. And we might think of Dulia, some people kind of, I think, with duly a Rocky Balboa, you know, movies, right? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of, that's that kind of that we, we praise him. We honor him in that special way. Saints more so, but it's, there's nothing wrong with saying, dude, I got to tell you, I, I don't know about you, but 
I never cry when I watch the Hallmark movies, but dude, <laughs> at the end of a Rocky movie, I mean, I'm all choked up. My hey, man, to that, I'm brother. trying not. To, I got a lump in my throat. That's kind of like it? Dulia. That's right. That's right. It's a, it's an affection. There's a sense of affection there of showing affection uh, to our fellow uh, brothers and sisters in Christ who have gone before us, but who are perfected in Christ, dwelling in heaven, and we give them the honor that is due to okay, them. Okay, and so then that raises the next question. I have a dear friend, uh, uh, Daniel Markham, a member of our cast, pro- former Catholic, uh, Protestant minister now. Um, and he, I said, now, when your mother passed away, when my mother passed away, Carlo, my ministry exploded. And I know that she's with I can. I don't, I don't know the mystery behind it, but I can say, Mom, pray for me. And there are right. times when I sense she's having joy in the moment with me. Right. But Protestants don't uh, think that you uh, don't understand the community of uh, saints. saints. Can you yeah. talk about what we mean by that? Yeah, well, first of all, we recognize that death does not separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That's St. Paul in Romans 8, verses 35 through 38, particularly verse 38. So we recognize that those members of Christ's mystical body dwelling perfectly in heaven, we're still united to them via grace and the order of grace. And consequently, as members of the mystical body of Christ, they can still affect our lives through their prayers. They're perfected in love and loving God, but they're also perfected in love of neighbor, and that love of neighbor moves them to pray for us and to bring about healing and bring power into our lives, of course, by God's permission, by God's grace, but nevertheless cooperating with God to continue guide and lead us in our journey of salvation. That's called the intercession of the saints. Yeah, dude, I, like, I mean, when you go into the Vatican and you see that the colonnade with the great witnesses, the great host yeah. of witnesses are Hebrews witnessing 12, to one. us now. And, yeah. and dude, I've been reading Life of St. Paul, studying him. Why not say, St. Paul, can you help me understand this? Or when you're right. reading Augustine, ask, you know, pray. pray. Okay, so I got another question for you. So, you know, you go to the Sistine Museum, and there's that one painting where the worshipers are down below having, uh, having the, mat, the, the Eucharist is being lifted up by the priest. You're having Mass. And then just above them, they're having Mass in heaven, too. Yeah, the Eucharist yeah. is kind of like the, the joining of heaven and earth. Indeed, uh, the it body is. and blood of Jesus. So I was, I, I've heard so many times from Protestants, you Catholics, you re-crucify Jesus every time you have Mass. Right. Uh, and that, you know, if I thought that's what Catholics believed, I wouldn't be a Catholic either. So. Right. Amen to that. What, so, what do we, right, what, yeah. Yeah, so if a Protestant were to say that, I would simply respond and say, you're rightfully rejecting <laughs> something. You know, we, you're rejecting that which we would reject as well, that we're re-crucifying Jesus and that his first death wasn't sufficient and wasn't enough. That's not what we mean or nor or what, what, what we're saying when we talk about the Mass as the sacrifice of Christ. As the Catechism makes it very clear and the constant tradition of the Church that the Mass is the representation. So it represents, makes present the one sacrifice of Christ in that it's the same priest making the offering, the same victim being offered, Jesus, same priest, Jesus, same victim, Jesus, and the same person to whom the offering is being made, namely the Father. That's what we see in the Bible. In the book of Hebrews, Jesus, our high priest, ministers in the heavenly sanctuary, and it belongs to every high priest to have a sacrifice to offer. What is he offering eternally in heaven? The same sacrifice of himself on the cross, the same priest, same victim, same person to whom the uh, offering is being made. And that reality is made present. We're united and made and joined to that very heavenly reality in the mass to where heaven and earth become one. But you can't do that. You can't be made present to be at the cro- at the foot of the cross at that moment of, you know. But God is kind of God, right? I mean, it's a cosmic um, event. I mean, remember sure. when Jesus met Moses and Elijah, they were still in Abraham's bosom. They hadn't yeah. they hadn't ascended. They hadn't gotten their their ticket into heaven yet, you know, until after Jesus died and uh, was resurrected. But in that cosmic way, across all time and space, what he did on the cross saved them, saves us, and. Uh, and um, and so that we can be made present. Okay, another quick question. Mary, immaculate conception. Right. So he, she didn't need a savior. 
Yeah, yeah. And that would seem and that would seem to contradict what she says in her magnificent Magnificat when she says I rejoice in God my savior. So right? what do we mean by immaculate conception? That doesn't mean yeah, that. what does that's it right. mean? It, that's correct. As Catholics we're not saying that Mary didn't have a savior as Pope Pius IX in 1854 defined that she was conceived by a special grace by the foreseen merits of Jesus's death on the cross. So Jesus her son is her savior. He saves her in a very unique and special way, where we're saved after the fact, like after we sin, after we've fallen into the pit of sin, and we're saved from that pit, right? Mary was saved in a prevenient way. So she was preserved from falling into the pit of sin. Amen. And so in, in that unique way, Mary was indeed saved by her son. We got to go, Carlo. Ah, oh, man, I mean, would, time would you, flies would you by. consider wasting time with me again? I mean, you got, <laughs> Dude, if I ask you on air— I, I would totally, totally dig it, man. Yeah. This would be so much fun. Okay, cool, man. We're talking with Carlo Broussard. The website is? CarloBroussard.com. What's my Carlo website? You don't even care, do you? What's I'll my just website? Google Bear Wozniak, man. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> and answer that phone. Okay, <laughs> Sorry ring it in the back. That. I had my timer <laughs> You almost on, made it to the end. Carlo Broussard, <laughs> Broussard, say it again with a K. How do you spell it? Carlo with a K, K A R L O B R O U S S A R D dot com. Prolific speaker, invite him to come speak. If he if he has the if he can squeeze you in, you should have him come talk to your group. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Until next time, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. You've been listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Go to bearwozniak.com to get your free audio and other exciting content. Plus, you can pick up the Long Ride Home 10-episode DVD set, autographed copies of Bear's books, Long Ride Home shirts, tanks, coffee cups, and even motorcycle pins and patches. And find out how guys can sign up for Bear's Man Cave online Facebook group, all at bearwozniak.com. 